Can you try? Okay. Yeah. That was good. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we can leave the rest of the bowl just to come to the day here. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming to this informational session for not the Intended Truth System. Um, we want to thank you. I'm not sure if there's anybody in here from you, but we want to thank you for um, graciously donating this space and especially on such short notice um, to get this information out. And so if you see someone on your way out, make sure they tell them thank you. This is um, really helpful for us. Um, we also want to thank um, the chamber in particular would like to thank all those who have been so involved in this conversation, um, the travel council for helping us host this and the um, Sorry, at Plico and UTA for involving um, industry in the conversation and creating some really good opportunities to have those conversations. Um, and we particularly want to thank um, NPS and this front row of staff here at Archon. Uh, we are so grateful for Patty and Kate and Amy for um, the conversations that they have had with us and for their willingness to um, engage in partnership with, with private and public. And it's been just a really good experience. Um, they've been very responsive when we go to them with our concerns. Um, and they, I think hopefully what you'll see in this is that they've taken some time to address some of those concerns of the industry in this plan. Um, and as, as we've been looking at this, talking to other chambers, and other uh, parks and really trying to figure out what some of the hiccups were in those that have tried this system before. Um, one of the number one things was getting the information out um, widespread quickly so that everybody is um, aware. And so that's kind of what we decided to do here. The purpose of this meeting is just for education on what to expect with this time entry system. And um, you're going to learn a lot in this great presentation. We're going to hold all of our questions until the very end because um, what we learned the last time was it answers a lot of them. <laughs> and so we're going to um, let them get through it and then we'll have a kind of a Q&A at the end. Um, and, and there will be plenty of time to, to discuss your concerns and your questions. And if we don't get to them, we are going to wrap up at 5 o'clock. If we don't get to your questions and concerns, um, we you are always welcome to reach out to any of us um, at Archers, Chamber, Travel Council. Um, everyone is very willing to have the conversations, and so just reach out. Um, we're also hoping to do more of these down the road as we learn and grow through this process. Um, and just kind of like a note, I think we all know that there's going to be a few hiccups um, implementing something new. There always is. And so just being patient um, through those, but also communicating. If you are hearing in your businesses or in your, in your, your um, conversations with the community, whatever it is, and you're hearing um, the hiccups and, and more complaints and what's working and what's not working, communicate those um, to us, to them, um, 
any of these channels, and we will definitely we'll be committing taking those into consideration. And we have this commitment from Arches to definitely adjust through this pilot type of entry system um, as needed. So um, with that, I am going to go ahead and introduce Patty Olson. She's sorry. <laughs> That's not you. There's another one. <laughs> she's so Patty's going to come up here and um, just kind of start it off, and then she's got um, they've got a presentation, and she'll just kind of nail through the line and pass the mic. Thanks so much. And uh, for those of you I haven't met, I am the new superintendent here. I'll take Anna, and this is this really like the long time for me, so I'm very excited to have this. Um, I work in the next 30 area. Thank you again. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the Mullah Travel Council and the Mullah Chamber for hosting us. So, um, you're going to hear me say this a lot. We are in this together. Our kids, I don't feel the need for our kids separately. Can you bring the mic up? We're talking with my hands. That's okay. <laughs> So our just met separately to work part of it. Success, success is going to require collaboration between us all. And as um, as was just said a minute ago, I am I'm happy to um, share my cell phone and give them a little So our goal is not to be an education. Our goal is to distribute it. Our current system closes the park at the main entrance and reopens when there is sufficient capacity at the three parking lots, Delicate Arch Windows and Devil's Garden. We have had parking spaces, continue to encourage visitors to come later in the day and to go to all those other great places that are in Arches to help distribute this information. But it has not worked at all. We continue to, our data shows that visitors go to Two or three of the primary sites, Delicare and Desmond's Garden. In addition, when we close the park, our permit is for visitors that have permits and other permit holders cannot get in. With the pilot, we will be able to allow all of the permit users to come in throughout the day. So, in addition, we've been doing a lot of homework. I think you all have been hearing that Zion, Glacier, Rocky Mountain, Acadia, Yosemite. Um, they all have done some sort of pilot. All of them are different, but the thing that is the same is they all started with a really good plan, and then over time, as some things worked and some things didn't, they adjusted that plan until it was more effective. And that is why it will be important, again, collaboration is our success for us to continue to hear from you as we go on. Um, but what is working and what can be improved? And again, all those parks I just talked about, they actually continually improve the process. So before we entertain questions, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Thomas, Public Affairs Specialist Focus. <laughs> uh, Caitlin Thomas, a Public Affairs Specialist uh, and Leading Communications for the Pilot, and Amy Tendrick will be the Project Manager for the Pilot. Kate and Amy are ready to lay out for you our current draft of the messaging, operations, for the pilot and to, and again to hear from you. Again, we are in this together. Success is going to require collaboration. So with that, um, turn it over to you. Okay, so that, that sounds pretty good, right? Can you hear me? Okay, fantastic. So just as Patty said, my name is Kate Thomas, and although I'm new to this position, I just started about three months ago. Uh, I'm not new to MOHA, I'm not new to this area. I actually got my start as a seasonal back in uh, 2007, working in Arches, and then I popped up to Candylands for a little bit, came back to Arches, and left in 2015, and have been working in other park sites across the country as well. Coming home just uh, just a few months ago, and I really do love Moab. I love Arches. This place is incredibly dear to my heart, and I think that um, something that really impressed me when I first got here was just how dedicated the team behind the pilot time entry system was. I think that there's really been a lot of care and thought that has gone into the creation of this program, 
And absolutely, just as Patty said, we really do care about what the community has to say, and we will be listening and responding to feedback as this pilot comes along. So I do want you to keep that in mind. And I'll go through different slides in this presentation that will provide information about the details of the pilot, but we will need to hold, I know you have all the questions, but we will need to hold those questions until the end, and then we will be happy to answer as many of those as possible before time runs out. But uh, Amy is an incredible wealth of knowledge. She's been working on this project for, for years, and we should be able to answer most, if not all, of the, the questions and the concerns uh, that you have. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started, and I will ask if August can flip my slide. Okay, great. So, uh, the first question that we had to answer, I think, is why pilot a time engine system? And most of you really are aware of this by now, but visitation at Arches has skyrocketed over the last 10 years or so. We started off at about 900,000 around 10 years ago, and now our visitation usually exceeds 1.6 million and has been seen over the last several years. So we really do see incredibly long entrance lines. We see traffic and congestion at popular sites and parking lots, and it really does create a negative visitor experience while impacting those park resources that we are dedicated to protect. So um, really, as we face all of these new issues, we were faced with the question of how can we guarantee those positive visitor experiences? How can we protect this park while still maximizing access? And I'll echo Patty again on this. Our goal is not to limit visitation, but distribute it throughout the day. And I'll show you a graph a little bit later in this presentation to show you exactly what we mean by that. But uh, essentially, we know that this community depends on our visitation as we do. And we want as many folks to have access to their park, but as safely and as enjoyably as, as possible. So over the last few months, the Park Service has been engaged with a variety of groups who reached out to the Chamber, the Traffic Council, we've um, interacted with the County Commission, our local and uh, federal elected officials, and we've also held two public meetings. And during those public meetings, we solicited public comment. And after uh, we reviewed those comments, we also did a lot, a lot of research, data collection, we determined that temporary time of reservations could better distribute visitors and vehicles throughout the park throughout the day. And it should provide them with a more reliable, more enjoyable experience. And as we go through this pilot, what we're going to do is collect additional information and we will gather feedback on folks' experiences. We will be monitoring how many people are in any given place at a certain time. And we'll be taking that data, analyzing it, and determining time to entrance viability for the future. So what that means is that this is not the end all be all. This is not our only solution to traffic congestion and, and traffic management, but this is a start and it's a great start. It's a good opportunity for us to collect that data and see if this can become a component of a larger strategy in the future. All right, next slide, August. So going back to those public meetings, we held two public meetings in September of this year and solicited comment during a 30-day comment period. And we received almost 300 comments. I think it was about 280 comments total. And over here is the breakdown of the correspondence that we received. And you'll see the very top one right there with 261 respondents was time to entry support. So we actually did receive quite a lot of support from the public. And then four down there, I think TR2000 here, four were against. So we do actually have considerable support for this system from members of the public and also from our local community. And I was actually surprised, you know, when I saw those numbers, I thought, well, shoot, that's, that's actually much more support than at least I was initially um, anticipating, but it does show that folks are ready for our service to do something to try to mitigate these issues 
and to really try to help you through these experiences of everybody who else's place home and all the folks that visit from all over the world. So we took a look at these comments, um, we analyzed some feedback, and we decided that we really didn't want to move forward with tech entry because we truly needed to help us proactively pace visitation into the park. And we also think that it's going to provide more reliable access. As Patty said in the beginning, right now, especially on holiday weekends and during the busy months over the summer, sometimes we really uh, we just are bursting at the seams. We'll have so many vehicles in the park, but there's no parking in any of those major parking areas, and traffic just overflows back up in variety of places. The entrance line has the lines over and over long, and it just becomes unmanageable. So we believe that this system will help spread people throughout the day and throughout the season to try and mitigate all of those impacts. Okay, so here's here's the big reveal. You may have seen the news release, you may have uh, seen it on Times and Tenet or heard on the radio that on Friday we did in fact announce that we will be implementing a temporary temporary pilot at Arches. And this system will run from April 3rd to October 3rd, 2022. And visitors can book reservations to the park on a first come, first serve basis on recreation.gov or by calling that number right there, beginning at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time on January 3rd, 2022. And the park will release these reservations at the beginning of the month, each month three months in advance in monthly blocks. So what, what that means is that when we pop on there at the beginning of January, all of the reservations for the entire month of April will be available. And then the next month, when you pop on in February, all of the reservations for May will be available. So it's block monthly releases at the first of the month, except for like January 3rd, where it's the third rather than the first. And I have another slide that shows the whole, uh, the whole schedule on that, but we also really heard a lot of feedback from locals about, well, what about folks who want to go the day of, or maybe they're leaving the day before, so we did want to factor that in. We wanted to keep our local residents in mind, and then also those folks that maybe just didn't get the memo, didn't realize that they have to have reservation. So for those that don't get an early reservation, we will be setting aside a limited number of additional reservations for purchase 6 p.m. the day before every single day throughout that time. So when folks come to our entrance station, for example, and they tell us that they don't have a reservation, we will give them some information and say, don't worry, don't worry. There are some reservations available for tomorrow. All you have to do is either call this number or hop on recreation.gov at 6 p.m. today for an entrance tomorrow. I will stress that it is limited, so this year not every single person who applies will get one of these reservations, but it is a great start. And this is one of the components of the system that can be adapted as we go on. And we might add more of these tickets in the future, just depending on uh, cancellation rates, no show rates, things like that. So just keep that in mind. Um, and here, I think, is one of the most important things for us local residents is that there are quite a few exceptions to this system. So we will not require time entry reservations for those with camping permits, backcountry permits, fire furnace permits, special use permits, concessions contracts, or commercial use authorizations. So there's really a lot of different exceptions. So folks that already go in, they make a different reservation, they will not require a time to choose to get to the park. And of course, our local businesses who have CUAs with us, right now when things overflow and we're forced to shut that gate, you can't get in. But under this system, anybody who, who is a CUA holder can actually access the park. And so I think that's a really big positive change that should help our, uh, our local community. All right, next slide. Okay, so how we actually implement this 
Um, these tickets will be required from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily during that October 3rd through, or sorry, April 3rd through October 3rd window. And we will allow visitors to enter the park during the one hour specified period of, of entry. So if you have a 9 a.m. ticket, we can get in at 9 a.m. all the way up to 9.59. So you have a one, a one hour period to enter the park. And after entering, this is something we also uh, use global feedback and public comment to help us come to a conclusion on this, but we will be allowing visitors to stay in the park as long as they like, and they can exit and re-enter the park on the same day as long as their ticket was validated at the correct time. So they have to be sure to get here outside, but as long as they do, they can come and go as they, they would like. So if they come in at 9 a.m., they go hang around in the windows, they realize that they're pretty hungry, they want to go get lunch back to Moab, that's okay. They can come back into town, go have some food, go, go shopping, and then head back out into the park for sunset. So they will have that opportunity and flexibility to, to come and go in that same day uh, as long as they validate their ticket at the correct time. Okay, so to enter the park, visitors will need three things. So one, they'll need that time entry ticket that's available from recreation.gov or by calling the recreation.gov number. They'll also need their photo ID to present with their reservation, and then they'll pay either the park entrance fee or bring with them a valid park pass. So annual pass holders still do not have to, to pay the entrance fee they can use their park pass to get in, uh, but for those who don't have the park pass, then they will just purchase the entrance fee at, uh, at the gate. So those are the three major things, that ticket, your photo ID, and then you either pay the fee or you bring your park pass. So does that make sense to everybody? All right. And then you'll notice down here, there's some cute little graphics. Uh, these are taken from our website that just launched on Friday, and I'll show you some more uh, information from the website in just a minute. Next. Okay, so here is the master plan, the big schedule that shows you all the dates. So feel free to take photos of this one as well. So uh, all those tickets will be released first come first serve on these dates. So we start January 3rd rather than January 1st, but every month thereafter is the first of the month, and it's for the entire month, three months in advance. So you'll be able to get tickets for any of those days. So if you want to come to the park in August, you'll hop on May 1st, and you can reserve any day from August 1st all the way through the 31st. And it just so happens that there's some lingering July tickets left. You can also pick those up too. So tickets will remain on the website for as long as they are available. And as far as you know for how quickly these will go we expect them to go pretty fast we don't know how quickly they will but we certainly just advise folks to hop on the very first day that they are available because there are a lot of folks that plan three months six months even a year in advance who will be hopping on the website so just if you're interacting with folks that are um, visiting your hotel they're coming to your business just let them know that they ought to hop on as soon as possible to, to make those reservations. And then the same thing goes with this day of reservations. Be sure to hop on right at 6 p.m. And that will help them get their, uh, get their ticket. So that's the schedule. Um, it's available on the website, and we can certainly get that to you a little bit later if you'd like that as well. Okay, thanks. So this right here is that graph that I mentioned just a little bit ago. With all of that process noted down, I just want to illustrate that we really expect to redistribute visitation and not limit visitation. And this graph right here, this shows the month of July in 2020, which I believe is one of our busiest months that we have ever had. And these are the hours of the day down here. These are the numbers of vehicles entering on that given hour. 
And as you can see, it's pretty pretty slow going between about uh, 1 a.m. to 5, and then it just skyrockets at about 5.30, and we have this huge influx of visitors in the morning. And this right here, that's what's causing all of that congestion, all of those wait times, all of that crowding in the parking lots. And so our goal with time entry is to have a certain allotment of vehicles that then spreads this out over the course of the day. So you kind of smush this part of the curve and spread it out a little bit farther into the afternoon. And that's really how we plan on distributing visitors rather than limiting them. So we're not, we're not shaving off the top, we're actually just moving from those peaks to lower areas. And if you look at the next slide, um, this one right here shows a snapshot of what happened at Glacier when they implemented their ticketed entry system. And I will say, and you pointed this out to me, that uh, this is not timed entry. So they just had a system where you were required to have a ticket for any given day and you could enter at a particular time. But what happened with their system is that you can see this blue line represents before they had ticketed entry. The orange line represents after. And so you can see that the peaks were brought down quite a bit. But you also have a really huge peak in the morning and then a significant peak in the afternoon. And so we actually do expect this to happen at Arches. So some of that, um, some of those high peaks that you'll see at the beginning of the day from our system will also be transferred over here. So we do expect a really big surge at about 5 a.m. And then a nice even curve throughout the rest of the day, followed by another slide at about five or six p.m. But again, because we're only allowing, um, or we're only requiring tickets from that period from six a.m. to five p.m., there is still opportunity for folks to come early or stay late. Okay, so another big question that folks have had for us is just how will we advertise this system? And this is something that we've heard from other parks who've implemented ticketed or time entry. It's uh, something we've heard from the business community as well, is that we just really have to advertise, 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 and get this information out as, as best as we can. So we are doing our part. We design a media package that we'll go through with you in just a moment. Um, but we also sent out a news release on Friday with those dates, those details, those times. And it's been picked up by a lot of major newspapers. It was, uh, it was in the Tribune uh, over the weekend. I saw it uh, locally. It also was in the Washington Post. And I spoke with the Associated Press. So it's been making rounds. And we're doing as much as we can to engage with our media contacts to get it in every major newspaper uh, across the country. So we're working on that. Um, and we're continually going to post reminders to our social media pages. We'll be engaged with you in the community and we'll be providing as much information as possible as we go through the system to the media, just so that folks are constantly reminded that this program is in place. Uh, something that we also thought was pretty important is that we wanted to get messaging to our guides and outfitters and hotels. So we will provide files and flyers and uh, also some back cards for our companies here to use and distribute to our visitors. So um, if you would like copies of those, feel free to email me and I'll give you my email after uh, this is done. Um, last but not least, we'll also have two park rangers posted at the NIC every day to help those who want reservations. So we'll have them there with a couple of iPads and they'll be able to walk folks through how they can make next day reservations as well. Okay. All right, so advertise, advertise, advertise. That's definitely one of the biggest lessons that we learned from other parks that I do want to take a moment just to go over a couple of things that we have learned from our partners. And just as Patty said, Glacier, Yosemite, Rocky Mountain, Virginia, uh, they all did something similar to this. So we passed uh, year two 
And they did so wonderful because they helped us maybe not make some of the same mistakes that they made in the beginning. So we are starting with maybe a stronger plan than some of these other parks did. And they all started with really good ones, but we we're even uh, better situated at this point to really succeed this year. And so they definitely recommended to advertise as hard as we could. Uh, provide really clear instructions on nps.gov and recreation.gov so we've been hitting that pretty hard uh, provide hotels and tools that they need to help guests make reservations um, but then these two last points i did want to talk uh, briefly about because i think there has been a, a little bit of nervousness around the community about you know will people just not come to know if they can't get a reservation to urgence are they going to cancel their trip if they don't get the reservation for urges. And what we found both from uh, just anecdotal evidence from Rocky Mountain and from Zion is that that's actually really probably not true. There's quite a few folks who make their hotel reservation. And then if they didn't know about the reservation system, they will even gamble and say an extra day to see if they can get into the park. So we do really believe that it may in fact increase the time that visitors spend in the Moab community visiting Moab businesses, spending time in Moab hotels rather than decrease it. Now, of course, we won't know this until after the pilot goes into place, but that is what we are expecting based on what we saw in Springdale and what we saw in Estes Park, Colorado. When Estes Park, I believe last year, that was their second year uh, doing time entry, and they still had their highest sales tax revenue uh, summer ever. So they were still raking in quite a bit of money, and the economy in Estes Park did not suffer from the time entry system in place. And I think here's just a quick summary, but before uh, we flip that out, I just want to go through the media packet. So I'll have August pull that up real quick, and I'll at least show you what we have put in. And then we'll take questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. So, this is our graphics package, and maybe August, can you just scroll through it slowly? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, this right here, this is um, our first flyer, and we have this on our website. So, you can go on to nps.gov right now and you can and download it. Um, the, the best link if you have a notebook is go.nps.gov forward slash arches ticket, and that will take you directly to the landing page that has these graphics and information. Uh, so, this is our first one, and it's still done in the next one. Uh, this is our paper version. So, the other one was the electronic version. This is the paper version. So if you'd like copies of these to print out, we are more than happy to give them and then scroll down again in August. But this right here, this is another updated version that has a QR code. And right now, the QR code is not active because the rec.gov link is not active, but it will be up on the 15th, right, Amy? So on the 15th, uh, we'll be able to distribute these flyers instead, and folks can uh, post those at the hotel or, or you know, the business, and folks can scan the QR code with their cell phone. Uh, so I think that that would be really, really helpful for folks who maybe don't have a reservation. And if you scroll down, we also have a sandwich board sign with a big old QR code too that we'll probably post in various places like at the next. So that folks can see that it's really it'll be pretty big. So if we're eye catching, they can scan that QR code and hopefully uh, get the reservation. All right. So these are just the graphics that are on the website. Um, and this is a snapshot of the website. Now, something that um, we did is so we received feedback from our Flipco meeting and uh, chamber meeting on Friday that we didn't want to have negative imagery. So we actually changed this photo at the top just to people enjoying Delta Arch rather than people enjoying the great big old crowd. So that photo has changed. Um, but this is what you'll see down here when you get on the website. I'm going to keep scrolling. We have the instructions and the dates on how to make a reservation. 
Uh, this is late we'll go live on January or on January 3rd. We have a lineup on December 15th. Do you think reservations for January 3rd? And then keeps going. Uh, we also have information on the park passes or folks who need to have with them. And again. And so this, I think, this is the best part. I know this looks a little bit small to everybody, but we have a frequently asked questions page. And on here, a lot of questions that folks in the community have asked us are represented on the website. So this is a really good wealth of information and it answers a lot of um, questions like, hey, if I have a senior pass, do I still need a reservation? Or uh, what times will it be issued? Or can I resell my reservation? You know, all those answers are available on the website. It is live right now, so you can watch it out on there if you'd like. Again, um, we posted this Instagram story on Friday, so that's actually pinned up at the top of our feed, so folks can swipe through and get information on how to reserve. So that's currently live. We still down the beginning. Did you end up changing the photo on this one too? Um, we so we actually did change this one because we thought it was a good before and after. And we have a lot of. Not very many people folks here, but um, that one's like the same. All of our other photos changed though. Um, and then this is a future Instagram story that will hop on um, in a few more days, just the folks can swipe through and be reminded on how they need their reservation. And then last, not least, actually, this is the second to last. Um, we, have, <laughs> we have a video that I'll show you in just a second. Let's scroll one more down. Uh, this right here. This is what I really, I think, is my favorite piece of information we design. This is our rack card, so it'll be printed on um, about envelope size, um, a card stack paper, and it'll be a little glossy, and it has information about what to do if you don't have a time that you to get. So folks that do arrive at the park and they go through the entrance line, they get all the way up to our booth, they had no idea that they needed a reservation, they will receive this with instructions on how to get those 6 p.m. tickets. And so we'll also have those available at the NIC. And if there are other businesses that would like them, we'll probably be able to distribute them um, to the community as well. We were fortunate enough to get some funding from CNHA to help us print these. So we'll be, I think, think about 500,000 copies of these right here. But, um, I think that pretty much sums it up. So before we go to questions, I'll just show you the video that we're working on. It is still a disclaimer. It is still a draft video. There's going to be graphics added. So you'll see rangers pointing to things that aren't there. Uh, but there will be text with information about how to serve, what things they need, what website they need to go to, and all of that information will just be spelled out on the uh, on the video. And we'll be posting this on our website. We'll have this on our social media. And then we're hoping that this government lab will also have this on the website too. So lots of uh, yeah, lots of good information. And I guess there you go. Yeah, I'm just gonna make sure the audio can be shared. Oh sure. I think I closed it. Hold on. <laughs> Stand up. Here we go. Hey there. Let me just make sure it's going to the system. This will be fine. Hey there. All right, it's not it's not showing online. Give me one second. Oh, okay. No, it's what it's, it's not showing up online. I just did a video. Okay, let me try it again. Here we are. 
I'm just going to keep it here. Yeah. You need to follow these steps before you can enter. Hey there. Are you Are you planning to It's how to plan your trip. A temporary pilot timed entry system to help manage traffic and congestion in the park. You'll need to follow these steps before you can enter. Secure your timed entry tickets in advance. Timed entry tickets will only be available online or over the phone from recreation.gov. Purchase your park pass or pay the entrance fee when you arrive. Bring your photo ID. You'll need to have this ready when you go through the entrance station. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily, each vehicle will require a reservation. So when can you make a reservation? Starting at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, January 3rd, 2022 on recreation.gov. Reservations will be available in monthly blocks three months in advance. For example, if you'd like to enter the park during the month of April, you'll need to reserve your spot starting January 3rd. If you plan to visit in May, you'll need to reserve on February 1st. Additional tickets will be released on the first of the month following the same pattern. For a complete schedule, visit go.nps.gov forward slash arches ticket. Didn't get a reservation in advance? No worries. A limited number of tickets will be released at 6 p.m. Mountain Time the day before your So the question is, will bicycles be subjected to the time entry system? And the answer is no. So folks can ride their bikes in without getting a time, uh, time entry reservation. They can also walk into the park too. So those big backpackers that you see on the side of the highway, they can walk right in. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll repeat the question. So, um, what she just asked is, what's your name? Karen. So, Karen just asked in the back if folks that walk in or bike in will be required to pay the entry fee. And the answer to that is yes. You know, we usually do uh, have walk up and bicycle fees, but they're significantly lower than the vehicle fee. I'd have to look up what the number is. Yeah, we're right. 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 So, they're expected to pay. Okay. There's an iron range around that. Um, on the patio at the visitor center, right by the white flag. Good question. So, the tickets that you're selling the day before at 6 p.m., are those for specific clients individually, and how many of them? 
So they are for specific times. So there's Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, sorry. The, okay. um, so the question was, um, the day before tickets, are they also for specific times of the next day? And the answer to that is yes. So when folks hop online, they will see the day in its entirety, but there will be tickets for every single hour available for that next day, if, if that makes sense. It's just a smaller proportion than the beginning. And we, we hesitate to give exact numbers for how many will be available per hour, just because this system will be adapting and changing based on a variety of factors, like how many people don't show up, how many people cancel, how many people arrive at 5 a.m. You know, does that, does that mean we need to change our morning allotment? So there's, there's a lot of variables that will go into how many tickets are available each day per hour, so it will be changing as the pilot progresses. But what we are managing for is about 2,700 vehicles per day, and that is the average of a typically busy day in 2019. So we took all of those really busy days, we averaged them out, and that's what we are managing for. Could you step over here? Or just by the that's just by the yeah. All right, and then I saw a couple of hands over here. Okay. What's your question? Is there a way to get in the messaging that you can get in with the flight and you can get in before 6 a.m. and after 6 p.m. as part of the messaging so that you know there's other options? Yeah, we, we have been, like on social media, we've been um, answering a lot of questions, but it's in our FAQs, you know, can I enter the park prior to 6 a.m.? And, and yes, the question, you know, the answer to the question is yes. So we do have that on the website. Uh, we also have the information about hiking and biking on the website as well. What about like the things for the hotels? We linked, I think, the, I think it was to our fill guide. It's just it's such limited space on the graph cards, and so that's why we just wanted to put the link in to the, to the ticket page, and that should have everything there on the FAQ segment. Yeah, so what Amy just said is that the information, um, because we can't quite fit it all on the graph cards or all on the flyers, the link go.fps.gov will direct you to the information where you can see the exceptions like coming in before six a.m. and riding your bike or, or walking in or, or coming in after my bike. So all of those will be listed on the website um, as the station is set. So the question is, when folks make a reservation, do they have to pay at that time? And the answer is yes. So they will uh, pay $2 for the $2 reservation fee. And that's as low as we can make it. Uh, we think that that was as cheap as our that would allow us to, to make those reservations. But you'll hop online, you put the reservation in your cart, and you just check out, and it's, it's a $2 uh, reservation fee. Cost of entry stay the same throughout the day? Yes. So the question is does the cost of entry stay the same throughout the day? And the answer to that is yes. So um, you'll just be paying the $2 reservation fee no matter what time of day it is. And then if you have a car pass, you, you won't be paying the additional fee. Um, and then if you don't have a car pass, it's the regular fee. Good question. Okay. Um, just more curiosity, but why the, the the dates in March and October, for example, is when they seem more busy than August. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's a really good question. And uh, we, we get a special lot. So the question is why, why April through October? August maybe isn't as busy as, as say, April or October, but we are limited at least this year on a very strict six month season. So we, we would love to have this in place all the way through October because we know how busy October is in this town and how busy it is in the park. And we do think that it would be effective to have it through October, 
But just based on how our seasonal staff is funded, we can only have what we call a defined season. So we have to choose a six month period. And it turns out April is actually about 15% busier than October, which I, I was surprised. I thought October would be busier than April, but turns out April is a little bit busier than October. So that's how we, we landed on April through October 3rd. Uh, however, that does not preclude us in future years or even later this year if we can find additional funding to extend our seasonal staff or get different seasonal staff or career seasonal staff. We use a lot of different pools of money and federal regula regulations on how we can actually manage and supply our staff. Um, we will do that, but we just couldn't promise that at this point. So we are under. Uh, promising and I'm hoping maybe to order the year later, either next year or later in the season. But that was a really good question. Well, I would love to say number of cars we have per day to be trained. So we can Yeah, so the, the question is, will the entry booth be able to handle the same capacity as 2019? And will we be able to get folks through the line? They say we get a big line. Will, will it back up to the point where maybe they're late, right? For their, their time. And so we have we have looked at that in our modeling. So we do expect that peak before the time entry starts. And that means that we are slightly reducing the amount of folks coming in in the early morning on the time entry system so that hopefully we don't have any of those entrance line backups. If we do, we can adapt the, the system and we can change our allocations uh, if, if we do see that. Um, I would say that if for some reason we know that there's, there's a really big backup and it's of our own making, um, we will probably be at least somewhat flexible for those folks who show up and they're just a few minutes late. You know, we, we can work on that one. Does so. that answer your question? And I think I saw one hand. Sorry, just uh, to go back to your funding uh, issue that you guys have for employees. So if you're looking at basing this on 2000, You have a 35 percent increase in courses a year. That's 700. That's it's like 14,000 members in the company. So, as a business, we would never open like just have our doors and make people pay from eight to five. Let everybody come in and grab whatever they want outside of those hours. If you're trying to discussion of having a, a like what days you're going to be paid that's why you're going to pass just like every consumer's going to pay that does come easier you know, have to have done this you know, to the effect of our entry for such a technology is your right one so yeah, yes, it, it is. And I'll repeat the question. And are folks still able to hear me? Yeah, I mean, to the best of our AV setup, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the question is um, Have we entertained ways of collecting fees outside of the operational, oh, just outside of the operational area? Yeah, I guess yeah, just I, stand over here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it might have um, and okay, so uh, the question is, have we entertained ways of collecting fees outside of the operational period? So that would be from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. And the answer is yes. So we are extending the hours of our fee collectors, so they will be out there before. 
and after the the operation period. And I don't know how else to describe it other than you know, operation period or hours of operation. So we are going to increase their time because we did not want to lose that revenue. We we saw that spike and said, oh my, you know, that is an opportunity for lost revenue. And it's also a missed opportunity to help orient visitors to you know the buy visitor experience as well. So we did want to miss that. We are going to have um, more staff during those hours. As far as like a self-pay system, that's something that we would have to talk about in the future, but it's not it's not off the table. But we are extending the hours. So. Yeah, yeah, just because I also think my job uh, the possibility of using visualization but like hallucinations or we'd like to convene the perfect opportunity to to be and it's in your your national right this is one of the most dangerous places for everybody actually Just try to turn it off. Yeah. Yes. I think it was working. Yeah. Okay. So the questions, there were two questions. And the first one was uh, you foresee an uptick in bicycle and e bike reservations, so more bike traffic than we are. But as most folks are aware, we don't have a very wide shoulder. We don't necessarily have a bike path up in the park. We have one that goes up to the park and through the entrance there, but not up um, once we get up over the hill. So I think that we will just have to be really proactive about safety messaging at this time. Now, as far as infrastructure for the bicycles, that will be a component that we look at in a future visitor use access plan. So we certainly will be looking at um, bicycle infrastructure, how we can handle bicycles and all of that in a future planning process. It won't be directly tied to this particular pilot, but after we gather the data from the pilot, we will then move forward into, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll move forward into an EPA, so the NEPA process, where we will formally review things like infrastructure improvements for bicycle access. Um, unfortunately, we're not there yet, but it's certainly something that's on the horizon that we want we want to take a look at because we do see that that's probably going to be a side effect of this is, is increased bicycle use. And so we want to make sure that folks are safe when we are moving. So that's the first one, right? And then the second question, which we expect to get, uh, was what about Willow Springs and Salt Valley? And with those roads, um, we will not be requiring a time entry ticket to travel on Willow Springs to travel on Salt Valley. What we are telling the public is that they are required to have that ticket to access the scenic drive. So access. Just gotta do this again. <laughs> so access the, the scenic drive. Um, now for our CUA holders and concessioners, they can go right in on, on Willow Springs, that's fine. And we do expect locals to access that road as well. Uh, we also are really seeking your help with this too, because at this point, we're not going to shut that gate that's right at Willow Springs and the, the fountain. Um, we could have to if everyone in town said, oh, if you just want to avoid time entry, go around, go the back way. We could see a real problem if, if that happens. And we don't necessarily want to close those gates, but we will if we have to. 
We're expecting about a 30 percent increase in traffic on those roads, just without anybody really spreading the, the word. Because folks will figure it out. I mean, folks will understand that. But if we as a community decide we can work together and not necessarily advertise that, it will be very helpful for this program and it will help us ensure local access as well. So I think that that's really the best answer that we have for you on, on Willow Springs is that the scenic drive is what requires the time entry pass. Um, we're not restricting access, we're not closing the gate at this time. It could happen in the future if we start seeing things like um, a, a real huge increase in use we start seeing a lot of flat tires, people stuck out there because they are our four by four roads. And we know that people get flats out there as it is. It is risky if you're just somebody coming in with your regular rental car, you can't do it. So we really need to be good stewards and just let our visitors know when we're interacting with them that it's not the same as for them. Uh, they really are better off getting into. I just want to be honest with that. I think that's what we're going to share that. Um, we will be posting the link there to be watching it. And that's a much more valuable Right. So, what Patty just said is that we are going to have staff there to monitor the conditions and we'll just adapt as, as we need. So, we'll definitely be keeping track of. Um, just the vehicles as you park owners, and then we will have rangers stationed out there. And I know a couple in particular that are really curious to see what's going to happen. So we're going to be monitoring it, and we will we will close it if we have to. So there you go. Yeah. One other thing. One other thing we'll be monitoring is the Utah's this uh, Utah Raptor State Park is under development. Of course, that will be impacting the road as well. Yeah. Okay. So those are your two questions. <laughs> I saw these things first, so Lacey. So online, we've got a question. Can a travel agent book for a client that they are fully funded and travel to our piece of work? Is the ticket time entry reservation made to match the person driving the um, And we have this the planned self drive for 2022. This will impact their itinerary if they can get a ticket to get it on. Okay, so the first question is, can a, a travel agent or hotel, can they book the reservation for somebody? And the answer to that is no. These are non-transferable reservations. So folks will require their photo ID with the reservation when they enter the park. And that's just to help us eliminate the potential for fraud. We don't want organizations buying up bulk passes or, or reservations because that is not equitable and it prevents general people from accessing their park. So each transaction will be limited to one reservation per credit card uh, transaction in that order. So the folks that they're making reservations, they got to get one at a time to try to limit that. Um, but that will help us prevent that from happening. So, so the answer is no, uh, we, we will not permit other companies to buy up reservations and then transfer them over to individuals or sell them over to individuals. And ID will be required, you have to have your face, your name on your ID, and then you'll have to be the same one on, um, on your reservation. And then the next question was a little bit more nebulous. What was, what was that? It was just a statement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know uh, they don't. So the, the question is if someone gets a, a trailhead shuttle from one of our seaways, so unfortunately, you saw our station holders. Yeah. Um, do they need to get the time to do a reservation? And the answer is no. So they can make a reservation in the seaway, and that seaway can take them up into the park, drop them off the trailhead, and come back. These discussions or any of the other parts been discussion of the like a local pass of the global 
consent to the reservation? So the, the question is, have we or other parks uh, take a look at local passes and maybe make some kind of a pass or exception for the local residents? And uh, we have looked at it, but we do not have the authority to do so. So because we are national parks, we are managing for the entire country and all of the citizens therein, and all of those folks have to have equal access to their national park. So I think that while we don't have a local pass, we do have local opportunity that other people don't, and that's that we can, in the day that we choose, enter the park either before that time or after that time. We have six months of the off season, but that's not happening. We also have the opportunity to every day hop on at 6 p.m. So we, we really are uniquely situated just by virtue of, of living here to have more access without encroaching on mother's opportunities. So that's the thing we're here. That's a good question. I think a lot of people want to do that. Thanks. Yeah. Will buses be handled differently? Will buses be handled differently? And uh, the answer is yes or right now, because right now they can't necessarily get in. Um, so they will be allowed to enter the park. They'll be able to go to the Unless they're commercial use. Unless there are commercial bus is a designated use for it. Right, right. So we have a lot of um, bus companies that have these mega speeding ways. Um, I think you know, maybe like Tau Tours is an example where they actually have a speedway that covers a lot of different national park units. So they just build them into one. But you say or by the day after 6 p.m. or after the Yes, so that, that is correct. Um, and it's, it's 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. So, uh, so the question was, can you mention the park before and after the, the time of the preservation period? And the answer is yes. And we do expect to see that. That's why we are um, modeling that graph with the next slide at the beginning. So we kind of expect it and are, are just planning a model based on that. So just to confirm, as a local business opportunity, it's not like so we can make the citizens be able to use that. Okay. So at this time, no, we do not have a cap on the number of speedways. Um, it is a process, though, and you are held to a lot of, of regulations and ethics considerations, but we do welcome folks to apply for their So I've got one more on that, and then I think we'll just do one more in the group to wrap up. Uh, how do you plan for individuals who make reservations but do not show up to the store? Okay, so there's two types. Of no shows, and the question is, how are we going to plan for no shows? And uh, the first type of no show would actually be a cancellation. So folks can hop on rec.gov and they can cancel. And the moment that they cancel, that reservation will go back on to rec.gov so that anybody can take it and reserve. So, so it does benefit people to just check every once in a while and just see if there's cancellations that pop up because our system does um, allow for cancellations. As far as no-shows go, we're going to be really keeping an eye on our no-show rate and that will inform our daily allocations. And so that's why you know, we're saying, okay, so we're modeling for about the 2,700, but we could increase that or, or decrease that based on our no-show rate. So if everybody's coming, and we're really overwhelmed in the early morning, that would be a different story than if we have a 20% no-show race, then we will certainly have additional reservations for future days, if, if that makes sense. So we can actually do, it's not exactly real time, but it is pretty close where we can see what happened the day before and figure out what we're going to do the next day. So does that make sense? And I 
if you have any questions, you're looking for those rack cards. I'm sure we're going to have boxes of those rack cards out where else. Um, if you are um, we'll trying to come up with the best ways to reach out to your um, guests, you know, you're already booked in April and March. Um, and you want to send out that information as soon as possible. So I'm going to with as a who we are. So um, if I haven't met you, feel free to come say hi. I don't think we've got everybody here. Um, but just that this is a big priority for us to come forward. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us to hit the bullseye for the communities that, you know, started out as best we can and have a little bit more information about our folks. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for coming out. This is very much a last minute put together thing. Apologies to the internet folks for the bad audio quality. I thought that we'd be able to get this mic going directly to the internet, but instead we used my uh, laptop microphone. We can laugh about it. Um, thank you so much. I think we're